As I was listening to Chief Littlechild, I was thinking of my hero, and some of you here who have taken courses with me in the past, and some of you who are my colleagues know precisely who I'm speaking about, um, none other than Nelson Mandela. Um, and as I listened to Chief Littlechild, what I was recon re recalling was not only his life and his continued struggle uh, to ensure that human rights is maintained globally, but I was also thinking of the speech that he made in defense uh, in, the, in, his, in the trial, how for him he was willing to die for the principles that he believed in, the principles of justice, the principles of non-racial discrimination. And as I thought and as I listened to Chief Littlechild, I thought of the Afrocentric concept called Ubuntu. And the Afrocentric concept Ubuntu advocates and urges that our humanity is contingent on the humanity of others. And that we ourselves only have humanity when we extend that to other people. And as I listened to the eloquent articulation of the links associated with the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and the way in which his articulation picked up on the links and the urgings of Dr. Marlene Brandt Castellano, I considered how important it is for us to recall the spirit of the proclamation that today we are bringing to witness. The Royal Proclamation was a proclamation that Spirit suggested that we would indeed walk arm in arm. And what I see here today is the spirit of that very notion that is being revitalized. In the process of that revitalization, I'm very delighted to introduce the next speaker, Chief Edward John, who is the hereditary chief of the Tatsien Nation. Um, he, sorry, my mistake, I'm, here, I'm, I'm kind of moving ahead of myself. Um, we'll replay it. Uh, what I'd like to do is introduce Craig Benjamin, and he in turn will introduce the panel. Thank you. My apologies. Uh, thank you, Peter. Uh, my name is Craig Benjamin. I'm a campaigner for the human rights of indigenous peoples with Amnesty International Canada. And on behalf of my, my friends and colleagues on this panel, I would like to acknowledge uh, the Mississaugas of New Credit and especially to express our thanks uh, to uh, Gary and Tina Sue, who opened us uh, this, they opened the uh, the meeting this morning and welcomed us to the territory, and of course to express our thanks uh, to York University for organizing this uh, this important event and providing us with this opportunity to be to be part of it. I know I'm very honored to uh, be able to to join such a distinguished group of presenters today. We've heard today uh, very powerful words, uh, very important words. We've heard words that were, that were very hard to hear, and one can only imagine how hard they must have been to share. But we've also heard inspiring and uplifting words, encouraging us uh, to, to look uh, toward a future that is built, as Dr. Castellano said, on a profoundly different relationship. And we've heard um, uh, Chief Willie Littlechild talk about the UN Declaration as setting up the framework for that new relationship, and a relationship which is, is very much, as any relationship, a both, about both partners, about Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples. Uh, and Dr. Castellano and, and uh, Willie Littlechild gave us both that image of the, the linking of arms in this, this work. What we want to do with the, in this panel is to explore that uh, in some detail in the substance of what the UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples uh, has set out for us. The Declaration is the first international human rights instrument to be developed through the direct participation of the rights holders themselves, and its provisions reflect the vision and the needs of those, those rights holders. 
the fact that it took more than two decades uh, to, for the declaration to be adopted is, is an indication of the resistance that Indigenous peoples met in that, that struggle. But its, a, it's eventual adoption uh, is a remarkable triumph, uh, all the more so for the fact that today even those few states that had voted against the declaration have now officially withdrawn their objections, so it stands as a global consensus instrument. The Declaration provides minimum standards for the protection of the rights of Indigenous peoples and it builds on an established body of human rights and it links the Declaration to those other standards such as the, the Convention on the, on the Rights of the Child. And this, the panel that uh, we have uh, with us for, for this session are people who played uh, an instrumental role in advancing the framework of rights that would become part of that declaration, who played a direct role in many cases in, the, in that negotiation uh, in Geneva, and who have been real champions of the declaration's effective implementation in Canada and around the world. The format that we're going to, to take for the next about hour and 45 minutes uh, is that each panelist is going to make a, a very brief introductory comment about the significance of the declaration from, from their perspective. Then we're going to go to an exchange among panelists. Uh, I'm going to ask a, a series of questions of each one. Uh, we hope it will be uh, inf uh, somewhat informal and uh, free-flowing. Uh, and then we'll turn the, the room over to you for your own, our own questions. Let me uh, briefly introduce uh, each of the, the members of the, of the panel. To my immediate right, uh, Ellen Gabriel uh, is the Vice President of Gundinostans, which is the Mohawk Language Custodians Association. She is one of the most prominent defenders of human rights in Canada uh, and the work that she is doing uh, both in uh, her own community of Gunasatagi and her work uh, uh, in a coalition that includes uh, many of our organizations uh, is at the forefront of the work of implementation of the UN Declaration. Uh, Jennifer Preston is with the Canadian Friends Service Committee, uh, Quakers. Uh, Jennifer is uh, uh, somebody who plays, um, has played multiple roles uh, as somebody who is uh, both a, a highly expert in the, the work that needs to be done uh, and has been a, a lead voice for uh, moving forward the declaration, but she has also done an enormous amount of, of that behind the scenes work uh, without which uh, we all know you make very little progress uh, and I think is, is somebody who uh, deserves credit as well for her role in bringing this panel together in her contribution to this event today. Uh, Romeo Saganesh uh, is a member of Parliament. Uh, he uh, represents the riding of Abitibi, James Bay, Nunavut, EU. Uh, Romeo Saganesh is an uh, uh, expert on international law and the rights of Indigenous peoples and somebody who has uh, really pl played a, a, an inspirational leading role in forging that alliance and relationship between Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples in support of the Declaration and helped uh, uh, open the door and, and build that relationship with, with organizations like myself, uh, like, like Amnesty and like the, the Quakers. And uh, the panelists at the, the furthest end of the, end of the table, uh, Paul Joff is a lawyer specializing in international human law and, and how it applies to the rights of indigenous peoples. Uh, Paul is respected internationally for his work in this area. And he's somebody who has given uh, with his, of his time and his expertise with, with great generosity uh, and has played an enormous role in, in strengthening the capacity of indigenous peoples organizations and non-indigenous peoples organizations in this common work. Uh, and so with those, those brief introductions, I'll ask each of the panels uh, to, to, as I say, to make a brief introductory remark uh, and begin uh, with Ellen. Um, thank you, it's a great honor to be here. I am Turtle Clan from the community of Ganesadage, and my, my Ganyakeha name is uh, Kazitzagwas. And it's a great honor to be amongst uh, such esteemed, knowledgeable, and generous people, um, on, on specifically on the area of human rights. And it's most important to me because one of the things that is really important, as far as I'm concerned, 
is yes, we're talking about reconciliation between Indigenous peoples and Canadians because of the, the traumatic experience we've had with colonization, but also reconciliation amongst ourselves as Indigenous peoples, amongst ourselves. What colonization did to our people was cultural shame. Shame to speak our language, a shame to practice our cultures. In fact, many of our ceremonies went underground, were practiced at night. Especially, it's odd for cultures like mine that do most of their ceremonies during the day. And I've had many elders who have taught me over the years in the course since the, the, the crisis. Many of them have been men, interestingly enough. And one of my elders taught me about the doctrine of discovery. And he taught me about that we never ceded any of our lands. And in fact, sharing our land is not the correct word. We allowed people to come and sit on our territory to make their homes. And we would help, they would help us as well take care of the lands and all our relations. And for me, the declaration, because of the, the devastating impact that colonization has had on us as indigenous people, Ukwahua people, and undermining and making us, in fact, deteriorating our obligations to the land, to each other, that this tiny little document that we have here is one of the framework, one of the tools we can use for reconciliation even amongst ourselves, because it tells us as Ogwenhua people, we have rights. We don't have to be ashamed anymore to speak our language. We don't have to be ashamed anymore to say I'm Ogwenhua and where I come from. An international body with the cooperation and full participation of indigenous peoples created an international, the most comprehensive international human rights instrument that did not create new rights, in fact reinforced the rights that we already had before Europeans came here. And to me, that is one of the most important things about the declaration and that is why I continue to do this because 23 years after the Oka crisis, my community has lost more land, and we have been under attacked by coercive efforts by the government of Canada. And I'm waiting to hear the government of Canada actually say they are truly and sincerely, without any regrets and without any thought of the cost, the money that is going to cost them to have real, sincere reconciliation. Peace, love, strength, respect. That is the basis of Kayanara Goa. And that is where reconciliation begins for me. Nyawa. Uh, just by way of introduction, one of the reasons, well, for both Craig and I, although I promise him not to speak on his behalf, um, although I often do, but organizations like ours were involved in the declaration during its development during the decades in Geneva. And one of the reasons that we were is something that actually uh, Willie touched on in his uh, presentation today and he was talking about non-indigenous peoples being at TRC hearings and what he said then was that you bear witness and one of the reasons that organizations like the Quakers and like Amnesty were in Geneva during those decades of work it wasn't because we were part of negotiating because we were not because the work that was being done with states was indigenous peoples doing negotiating with states but our organizations were there to bear witness to what was happening and how that process 
uh, was a unique process. Um, in many ways, as Craig said, the rights holders were part of the negotiation. Also, in the amount of time that it took to create this declaration, it makes it the most discussed instrument in the history of the United Nations. And so, uh, organizations such as, often we would get say, oh, well, why are you here? You know, what's your connection? Um, why would your organizations be interested in this? Because when the human rights of indigenous peoples are somehow presented as less important than human rights for other peoples, we all have a problem. And, and we should all be concerned about that. And that also is reflective of what, what the TRC is talking about, about non-Indigenous peoples bearing witness through that experience. This is something that we all need to be engaged with. And so that is what uh, has motivated our work uh, both during the, the years of development and now in the work on implementation. And um, uh, one of the, when we were talking about this to prepare for this, one of the things that I was looking at was a quote that's actually from um, the Honorable Rosalie Abella, who's now on the Supreme Court, but this quote is from her, was not, she did not give this as part of her work on the Supreme Court, but this is from a, a law article where she says, silence in the face of intolerance means intolerance wins. Indifference is injustice's incubator. It is not what you stand for, it's what you stand up for. We need more than the rhetoric of justice, we need justice. And that, of course, is why non-Indigenous organizations and non-Indigenous individuals are to be part of, the, of this ongoing work and have been part of it and continue to be part of it. Dakshit <laughs> Those were a few words of uh, greetings and welcome and thanks as well. I was uh, up in Kujwak uh, yesterday with uh, my leader of the NDP, leader of the opposition. So that's about 2,500 kilometers from here. It was hot and sunny up there. It's cool down here. <coughs> and as they say in French, le monde à l'envers. Um, I'm pretty, uh, I, was, I was honored to be invited to this panel because uh, uh, I get to see people that I haven't seen for a while since uh, the work that we've done over the years in Geneva. Not that I missed them a lot, but <laughs> uh, but I'm I'm busy. Uh, I'm busy now as a member of parliament, uh, <clears throat> and I represent the second largest riding in the country. Uh, in fact, I represent uh, <clears throat> more than half of the landmass in Quebec. So I always like to say that you're looking at half of the province of Quebec right here, right now. <clears throat> um, honored to 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 see them as well because uh, those are those who are one of the uh, fringe benefits, I guess I would, I would call them, from doing all this work over the last, <clears throat> for over 20 years, uh, for my part, uh, I started in 1984 in Geneva uh, on the invitation of uh, uh, Dr. Grand Chief uh, Ted Moses in 1984, asked me to accompany him to Geneva. And I like the way he put it uh, in those years, he said, Romeo, why don't you come? You don't have to do anything. You don't have to say anything. Just watch, and that is what I did. And I learned over the years with the people that I met in Geneva. And one of the one of the better things that that happened in Geneva as well is that we forged such great friendships with uh, so many people, so many great people, and so many great minds. So I'm I'm honored to be sitting with with all of these uh, panelists here today and see some of my good friends, uh, Willie and and Ed today. Um, I was born in the bush, uh, and I 
lived off the land with my parents and my siblings for the first six or seven years of my, my life. We're not too sure exactly. I'm registered 62 with Indian Affairs, 61 in Quebec. I don't know why. Uh, but uh, for the first six and seven years of my life, I spent uh, living off the land, hunting, fishing, and trapping with my father, my mom, and my siblings. And Dr. Uh, Castellano spoke about uh, uh, the fact that reconciliation runs through the land. I can relate to that statement because um, if I hadn't had that opportunity to live the first six or seven years of my life off the land, uh, with my parents living the traditional way of life, I don't think I would have survived uh, what happened to me afterwards. Uh, you uh, probably know that I was taken away as well. I'm a survivor of the res residential school system. I spent 10 years in residential school, like most of my, my sisters and brothers. So I think the land and the culture that came with it, the language that came with it, the way of life that came with it is what saved my life uh, today. So from the, from the tent in a very cold October morning in 1961 or 62 uh, to becoming a member of parliament, I can, I can attest to the fact that there is a constant thread of injustice. There is a constant thread of violations of my rights, of the fundamental rights of my people throughout those years, even to this day. And however grave those injustices, however violent those violations have been to my people, to me as an individual, but to my people collectively, I always attempted over the years to try to bring people back together. Because that's where we all belong. And, and Willie, in his uh, speech, uh, spoke about the, the UN Declaration being calling upon us to work together. It so happens that working together is the, the political slogan of the NDP. That's the extent of my political partisanry today. <laughs> I won't go any further. <laughs> but uh, throughout my life and throughout uh, uh, the 30 years of being in this business, uh, uh, my, my objective, my goal <clears throat> as a person on behalf of my people was to bring people together uh, in negotiating agreements, in working for 23 years, in the discussions and negotiations for the UN Declaration. Uh, even to this day, as a, as a member of parliament, uh, uh, maybe you know, maybe you don't know, but uh, uh, as members of parliament, we have a right to to submit and table uh, private members' bills. And my my first private members' bill that I that I uh, tabled in parliament uh, in January of this year was to make sure that all legislation that went through parliament, the Parliament of Canada, is in accordance or in compliance with the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, because I, I truly believe that it is the path to reconciliation for this country. And I almost envy people like uh, Willie Littlechild uh, and the rest of the commissioners, uh, because they sit on a, uh, on a commission that is, in my mind, will be an institution. It should be an institution. It should be the institution of that very new beginning that Stephen Harper talked about in, in 2008, five, year, five years ago. Because that's where we need to go uh, as peoples in this country. Um, I, I'll come back with some concrete examples about how to achieve that, uh, um, at least uh, in my view. Uh, there are some examples that I can, I can talk about, uh, uh, that I can think about uh, throughout the, the 30 years of working with the Grand Council of Cree in particular, but uh, with Aboriginal peoples in general.
I'd like to begin by looking at Article 43. Uh, the moderator, Craig Benjamin, mentioned that these are minimum standards. But it's important to note, it's on page uh, 38, it's important to note that it's the minimum standards for the survival, dignity, and well-being of indigenous peoples. And you've heard witness today from survivors, you've heard from Romeo and Willie, and uh, you'll hear from Ed John and others. Um, it's not just about survival, it's about well-being. Because everyone in Canada, as peoples or as individuals, uh, should have well-being. So when you're interpreting any provision of the Declaration, you should look at it in terms of, is this interpretation, let's say if a government gives an interpretation, is it achieving well-being? And if it isn't, then it's outside of what the Declaration was intended for. Now, uh, just as a, a point, you never look at any single provision in the Declaration in isolation. You can't interpret it in isolation. You should read it in the context of the whole Declaration and also international law as a whole. And then you can also bring in uh, domestic law or domestic arguments because all of it should fit together. The international human rights standards here uh, serve to reinforce domestic law in Canada. And the last thing I'll say is, um, just as a side point, they always kid me about this, but you should really number your preambular paragraphs. <laughs> there are 24 of them, and if you don't number them, it's hard to have a conversation. For instance, preambular paragraph 7 is what I want to refer to, and that's on page 12. And once you have the PP1 to 24, you'll get there very quickly and you'll get to know it. But I just want to read the beginning. It says, recognizing the urgent need to respect and protect the inherent rights of indigenous peoples. The rights are inherent. Human rights are inherent. Um, what we're trying to do with the Declaration is, first of all, governments and others have to recognize that there is an urgency. It doesn't make sense uh, that in 2013, the human rights of indigenous peoples are not recognized and protected. So um, with that type of context, we'll discuss the UN Declaration. Thanks. For a moment, uh, Paul. Uh, and let me ask you, you, you said that we have to understand how not only does each article in the Declaration fit with the other articles, but the Declaration fits together with the larger body of international law, and it fits together with domestic law in Canada. The, the federal government inevitably, in talking about the Declaration, claims the Declaration has no legal effect in Canada that is solely and strictly aspirational. Quite clearly, you're saying so something else. What's, what's, the, what's the argument, what's the rationale for saying that this instrument is, actually has legal effect in Canada? Well, the Declaration was adopted, as this booklet shows, as an annex to a General Assembly resolution. And usually General Assembly resolutions are not binding. But the Declaration may not be binding in the same way as treaties, but it does have diverse legal effects. And for example, uh, in Canada, the Supreme Court of Canada recognized back in 1987 and since then re repeatedly that declarations and other international human rights instruments may be used, uh, well actually said it more strongly, they are relevant, I'm quoting now, relevant and persuasive sources for interpreting domestic human rights in Canada. That's how strong it is. And uh, the, there was a child and family uh, welfare case that later perhaps it'll come up some more, but the Federal Court of Canada confirmed explicitly in its ruling that you can use the UN Declaration, and in that case they also referred to international treaties like the Convention on the Rights of the Child. You can use them to interpret domestic law in Canada. And then we were in Geneva in February 2012, 
and Canada was addressing the UN Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination, and uh, Canada stated to them, they basically conceded, because we had put a lot of pressure on them, that not only can you use the UN Declaration to interpret domestic law in Canada, but you can also do it for the Constitution. And so that is huge in terms of potential legal effects, because you have Section 35, for example, which deals with the uh, protection of Aboriginal and treaty rights. Thank you, Paul. And maybe just to, to follow up on that a bit with, with, with Romeo, because you referred to your, your private member's bill already to uh, you know, bring, give the declaration uh, effect in, in Parliament. How do we you know, overcome the situation where we have, on the one hand, uh, courts accepting the relevance of international standards, such as the, the Declaration, but a government bringing forward legislation with profound impacts on the rights of Indigenous peoples and asserting that the Declaration is, and in fact, you know, other standards of, of human rights protection for Indigenous peoples are, are irrelevant? Well, I think it's worth uh, mentioning, uh, first of all, on, uh, with respect to Canada's attitude uh, in regards to Aboriginal rights and treaty rights in this country has been lamentable for many, many years, and it continues to be that way. Um, let's not forget that Canada spends over $300 million fighting Aboriginal treaty rights in this country, even though most of these rights have already been affirmed by the courts themselves. So. Uh, we're, we're being put as Aboriginal peoples in constant adversary roles with the government of Canada whenever, whenever it comes to uh, uh, Aboriginal rights and treaty rights in this country. But I always say, it doesn't have to be that way. It doesn't have to be that way. Uh, the first, first and foremost, there needs to be a change of attitude uh, by the governments vis-a-vis uh, -vis Aboriginal treaty rights in this country. And, and their human, international human rights. Um, the, other, the other aspect to, to all of this is, is of course, uh, that there are other uh, measures that uh, I would like to take before, before I'm done uh, with the Parliament of Canada. And one of them is uh, perhaps another private member's bill to, to amend section 4.1, paragraph one, of the Department of Justice Act to vet, in order to vet legislative uh, proposals against Section 35 of the Constitution, uh, to make sure that any legislation that's being contemplated or proposed by by government is in compliance with Section 35 of the of the, of the Constitution. That is that uh, we I noticed since I got to Parliament. Two years ago, um, most of the legislation uh, that has been proposed by the government, by the Harper government, uh, did not go through that process. Uh, most of the legislation being proposed by the Harper government is being opposed by First Nations in this country because there is not sufficient uh, co uh, consultation and accommodation. Uh, because those those are corresponding duties. Uh, you have a duty to consult and accommodate according to the concerns that were expressed in that consultation. If there's no meaningful consultation, if there's no intent to accommodate, accommodate the concerns that were expressed in those consultations, then that, uh, that duty is meaningless. So the, we need to have measures in this country that will, that will uh, take that direction. And, and the other aspect that I would just want to mention quickly with, uh, in this regard is the whole notion of relationships. That, is, that should be always the number one item on the agenda between peoples, is their relations, their relationships. Uh, that is not happening. There are very simple, straightforward principles under the, under the UN Declaration and other agreements that uh, at least the Cree have signed. Uh, cooperation, partnership, mutual respect. Uh, I was before a parliamentary committee in Quebec City in 1992, when I was when I was deputy grand chief for the Grand Council of the Cree, and we were fighting yet another hydroelectric development in our territory, and I told the minister in the parliamentary committee, you know what? If your government had come to the Cree 
and said, here's a, here's a project. We want to develop this project. What do you think? Is there a possibility of an agreement? The story of the Great Wall Project would have been very different if that had been the case, but it was not. It was the same old attitude of disregard for uh, fundamental rights of the Aboriginal peoples. And, and, uh, and I think uh, when the free prior and informed consent that Willie talked about, is, uh, he correct, characterized us uh, the, the right to say yes. Well, most of the time, with all the projects in this country uh, that, in, that, uh, that have an impact on Aboriginal rights, we, we don't even get the opportunity to say yes or no. They just ram through with development, and that's, that's been a problem. So there's also that relationship that is broken in this country. Just to, to follow up with you on that, uh, one of the other things that um, Dr. Little, or the Chief Little Child said that, that stuck in my mind was that we talk about truth and reconciliation, but there's, there's steps in between. Uh, and in between the, the two, there has to be healing and there has to be, to be justice. Do you think these, these core principles in, in the declaration of the, 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 the principles around the relationship, uh, the, the collaboration, of consultation, of obtaining consent, are these part of, of taking those steps of, of healing and justice? Romeo? Yeah. Romeo, if you well, don't mind. Me again? <laughs> Um, uh, definitely, definitely, because uh, in, you would have a very different uh, uh, relationship with Aboriginal peoples in this country if that mutual respect was there. Uh, partnership for me, what it means is that uh, governments uh, that know most of the time that uh, projects have uh, impacts on Aboriginal rights or treaty rights in this country, uh, just decide to go ahead uni unilaterally without even consulting uh, most of the time. So that's not, that's not partnership. Uh, when, when the Cree won the forestry case, we, we had this a huge forest, forestry case in James Bay against the 27 forestry companies that had license in northern Quebec. Uh, and then December 20, uh, December 2000, December 20, 2000, yeah. Uh, the, the Superior Court of Quebec came down with this, with the decision that the, provision, uh, the provisions of the Quebec Forestry Act were incompatible with the, uh, the terms of the James Bay Northern Quebec Agreement. That meant the, an entire forestry industry was at stake. That meant 18,000 jobs in Northern Quebec were at stake with that decision. And it, it took that for the government of Quebec to realize, oh, Oops, I have to talk to these people. And, and when Premier Landry, who was Premier of Quebec at that time, came to us, said, okay, let's sit down and, and settle this forestry case, we said no. We said no, we will take this opportunity to settle our relations. And that new relationship agreement that we signed in 2002 with Quebec uh, brought about the, uh, a mutual respect and cooperation uh, since then, in 2002. And it's been going well since then. There's, there, you will not find under James Bay North and Quebec Agreement any provision that deals with consent of Cree for development. But there is no project that will go ahead and create territory. And the governments and developer, developers know that there is no project possible without the participation, partnership, and consent of the Cree. That's, that's how it should be. That's real partnership. Just uh, uh, as a... As a, as a quick information, between 1975 when the Cree signed the James Bay North Quebec Agreement to 2002 when we signed the new relationship agreement, the Grand Chief and the Premier of Quebec, between 75 and 2002, met about seven, eight times during that period of time. Since 2002 to this day, they meet about three, four times a year. Now that's, that's, that's what a relationship should be all about. That at the same time, as positive and encouraging as that is, what we hear quite often is governments asserting that they need to act against the rights of Indigenous peoples, as you said, to, to spend all that money, marshal those resources to fight against the rights of Indigenous peoples, supposedly in the interest of non-Indigenous peoples. And, and I think that when you were talking, Jennifer, earlier about, about bearing witness, part of that too, I think, has to be the, the role that, that non-Indigenous organizations, community groups, individuals have to play in standing up just to say that you know, the, the interests of, of non-Indigenous peoples can't be equated with an attack on the rights of Indigenous peoples. 
Absolutely. I mean, I think that uh, when, when, and it is about relationships, and, and that is also what reconciliation about. And one of the things that happened is when we had the apology in the House of Commons, um, and, and so it, the, the apology was the act of saying sorry, but an apology is more than saying sorry, and an apology is about a commitment to change. And what and, and, a, and reconciliation means that we have to see a commitment to change. It doesn't mean that we forgive and forget. And so, and as it has been already said today, we have to reconceptualize our relationships. And as Romeo said, you know, the the for for the Cree, a previous relationship not working, but in many parts of the country, that's still the status quo. That, that's not a useful relationship. And it isn't just about the governments. It's also there is a role for non-indigenous, uh, whether it's NGOs, whether it's uh, faith-based groups, whether it's community groups or whether it's within academic institutions, there's a role to say, you know, that's not acceptable. You know, and as our moderator this morning, he finished the morning remarks saying that he was proud to be a Canadian, but he, but he wasn't proud of this piece. And, you know, we have, we have to have a situation in Canada where um, that, that, that we, have, we have reframed um, our relationship, and I think that that's what the declaration, uh, why the declaration is such a good tool is because the declaration is about a blueprint for change. And, and we, we know, and, and we all heard this morning from the survivors, we know that the existing, uh, the existing situation in this country is not workable. And it, you know, all of you that were here this morning, you know that the conditions that led to, to those stories is not a part of a country that you want to be a citizen of. So then it's not enough to just say, well, 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 we're sorry about that. No, we have to say, okay, so what do we need to change? How do we need to move forward in a different direction? And this is one of the reasons why we feel the declaration is such an important tool, because the declaration is giving us uh, the, the steps towards that and working on implementing the declaration is giving steps to move that relationship and to reconceptualize that relationship. And, and I think, you know, we had a meeting recently um, with a government body who at the end of it they said, well, yes, but you know what, I think it's too difficult. Um, and that's the wrong answer. It is difficult. I mean, it, we're not saying that implementation of the declaration is just something that we can sit down and have a panel about and then boom, tomorrow we're all on our way. It will be, but that, but too bad. Um, you know, the province of Ontario employs 1,000 lawyers. Well, there are enough smart people that could sit down and work on it. It might be difficult, but how do we do it? And so, you know, and as Romeo was saying, the amount of funds that government puts towards fighting Aboriginal rights, one of our colleagues um, did a very innocuous search to discover that the Department of Justice has on its payroll, the Federal Department of Justice has on its payroll, 700 lawyers who are working to oppose Indigenous rights in this country. How is that acceptable? How can any of us think that that's an acceptable way for our tax dollars to be spent? It isn't acceptable. So that engagement in changing the actual framework um, of, of how we approach all of these issues is everyone's responsibility. Earlier this morning, and we've, we've been given as part of the frame for our discussion, the fact that this is the, the 250th anniversary of the Royal Proclamation. And one of the things that was talked about this morning, and uh, Dr. Malloy talked about this, is we have uh, a history of, of treaty relationships, relations between, between nations that set up a relationship that in name is, a, is that kind of relationship of, of, of partnership, of, of, of collaboration. But what we've also heard is we have an, had an immediate history of violation of those, those, those very treaties, of those, those promised relationships. And the issue seems to come down to largely one of, of power, that the government could get away with violating those relationships. Ellen, I mean, you, you, you began by talking about the, 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 the profound uh, trauma, the harm done and continue to be done by, by, by colonial mentalities, colonial programs, policies. Does the, on a pragmatic, practical level, does the declaration alter that power relationship in any way? I think in theory it does. In reality, it's, it's not because it's not being implemented. And one of the things that I think is, is really important to note is what Paul said, is that you don't take the declaration in isolation. So if I look at some of the, the articles that talk about forced assimilation and destruction of culture, 
and the right for, you know, just like from the rights of the child, the right of the child to be, to have an education in their own language. Um, one thing that we see very much in our communities is decrease in funding to education and almost no funding, at least no recurring funding for language and culture. It's not enough to say that you're sorry. When it comes to saying, well, we did this, this, and this to your people, and these were the effects on your people, and do nothing, and in the meantime we're struggling, it's almost as if they're sabotaging their own apology, because as time progresses, we are losing those speakers. We are losing those people with the traditional knowledge, and it's not enough to record them. Because what you have to do is like, like any apprenticeship or, or mentorship, you have to be guided, you have to be taught, you have to, when you speak a language, especially an indigenous language, it's a way of thinking, it's a way, it's your cosmovision, it's your perspective on, on the world. And, and what we see today is everything going against it. And it always brings me back to, to Jean Chrétien and Pierre Elliott Trudeau, the late Prime Minister of Canada, in the 1969 white paper policy when they said, when you no longer speak your language or practice your culture, you will have become assimilated. And, and yes, you know, I'm, I'm, I won't talk about me because I'm not a good example of this, but Romeo is. So you, you look indigenous, right? Uh, I come from a long line of Turtle Clan people, so regardless of what anyone says, I have clan. But you look indigenous, and I see this from people who are adopted, and they say, look, I look in the mirror, and I see an indigenous person, I see a native person. But when I go with other indigenous people, I, don't, I can't relate to them, I don't feel it. I don't know what it's like. And, and so the declaration for me, it takes all those things that were attacked by colonization. Language, culture, identity, the family unit, our relationship to the land, our culture, our, our ceremonies, our spirituality, um, our health, our physical health, which rely on the land, we rely on the medicines for, for it. It takes all that, it encompasses it. And then when we look at, say, and our customary laws, and we use them together, we say, you know, it's almost like, finally the white people got it. They understood that you cannot base your identity basically based on a picture and a passport. It's about a way of life. It's about a way of thinking. And it's about upholding your obligations. You know, our ancestors had a tougher life than we did. They went through, and, and I'll, I'll, I know in my community, the smallpox epidemic was something that was inflicted intentionally. We had 150 children who went to Shinwak Indian Residential School, industrial school, it was an industrial school. Six who never came back, one who was 12 years old who died at childbirth. She never came back. And in, in it, to me, it's about what kind of legacy do you want to leave to present and future generations? What kind of stories do you want them to tell about you, about your people in 2013, in your attempts to bring about peace? And, and to me, that's, that's part of what this declaration stands for. And that's why it's, it's you know, I'm, I'm so uh, thankful uh, to be sitting on, in this panel with these three people and, and yourself because you get it. You understand that justice doesn't just mean uh, a fair and equitable settlement. Justice is the recognition, uh, as Willie said, of the truth. Justice is the recognition that as indigenous people, we are nothing without our land. We are nothing without our, our languages and culture. We are self-determining people. We are not minorities. We don't have the same history as, as people who come from other continents. We are the original people of this land. Our oral stories say we come from this land. We do not come from China. We do not come from Russia. 
Perhaps some people, you know, they crossed the Bering Strait, but the traffic didn't say this one way only. Our people tell us our DNA is from the Americas, Turtle Island, and those are the kinds of stories that I think the Declaration will allow us to do when we take over control of our education. Uh, Paul, you are. To follow up on what Ellen said, Ellen mentioned that the declaration isn't being implemented, and I think you meant by the federal and provincial and possibly territorial governments. The compelling reason why this declaration has to be implemented is that it's based on the precisely the same principles and values that Canada has right now and that are also in the international legal system. And Chief Wilton uh, Littlechild read out earlier Article 46.3, and he mentioned the principles of justice, democracy, respect for human rights, equality, non-discrimination, good governance, and good faith. These are Canadian principles and values already. So why would any government in Canada refuse to apply them to Indigenous peoples? And it is impossible to ever achieve reconciliation if you do not respect and protect human rights of indigenous peoples. It is also impossible to claim that there is good governance, as mentioned in Article 46.3, without respecting and protecting the rights of indigenous peoples. And the Supreme Court of Canada has an important principle that the Crown has a uh, constitutional duty to uphold the honor of the crown. Well, you could never uphold the honor of the crown if you're not respecting the human rights of indigenous peoples. And I noticed that you carefully distinguished between that uh, federal, provincial, territorial governments may not be implementing. And I think the other part of that, of course, is that there is implementation going, going ahead at other levels, other, other ways of implementing. And in fact, I think, Ellen, you have an extraordinary example of implementation in the, in the work that, uh, that uh, Gundinostad is doing. Yeah. Um, through the help of, of Jennifer's organization and Kairos, uh, we undertook um, the enormous task of translating the UN Declaration into Kanyakeha, which is uh, what you know as Mohawk language. And um, it was three months of, of negotiating back and forth with the translator and, and my boss who also translated and edited. And the things uh, yeah, within, there's concepts within the declaration which we, in order for us as indigenous people, we, it's important for us to put it in our language because the concepts sometimes do not quite jive with our customary laws. They're similar. But because, like for, Kanya, for us, Kanyakeha, 80% of our language is verbs. We have to describe something. So we describe something that's a concept that um, might be like human rights. How do you, how do you say human rights, you know? And, and um, what, what does that mean? Because, yes, we have rights, but we have obligations. Um, so it took three months to, to make this wonderful document, and we have a limited... Um, printing of it, and I, I welcome the first whoever people to come up here <laughs> and, and get, them, get, get themselves a copy. But um, I'll say it out very slowly because if you, if you read it, um, I don't know if the cameras can get it. Yeah. <laughs> And that actually means United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. So it's, um, it's, a, it's, it's something that I'm very honored and proud to have been part of. I typed it, that's all I did. <laughs> I typed it, but if you know, the standardization of Mohawk is, like many other indigenous languages, were, were oral traditions and you have these glottals, and you have these upstresses and downstresses and lengths. And, um, uh, but I come from uh, the oldest, I'm proud to say the oldest Kanyakahaga community that exists today, 
Kanesadage, which existed long before Europeans arrived. Our community is mentioned in the high, high condolence right of a chief. We were the first community to accept Kayanara Goa, and we have the oldest dialect. And we're not saying we have the right dialect, Agwazasne, Kanawage, all the other communities, but we have the oldest dialect. So I'm very proud to have uh, been part of this and to thank, and that's why it's so important to have the NGOs um, participate in the implementation of the declaration because they support these kinds of activities. So, so thank you. And uh, Eleanor, you mentioned uh, that the Quakers were, were an organization that helped support uh, this translation. But, but Jennifer, I was wondering if you, if you might have some other examples you could share of, of you know, practical implementation of the declaration. Um, yeah, I, I think in terms of implementation, um, the first step of implementation is that people have to know it. And indigenous leaders didn't travel from around the world to go to the UN for 20 years so the document could sit in the library in Geneva. Um, and so one of the first things that we did, all of us were working in a coalition um, of both non-indigenous and indigenous partners. And one of the first things that coalition did was to produce the booklet, which you all have here today, I know, because my aide made sure that you all had it here today. <laughs> um, and uh, the organizations that produced it are on the back, you'll see. And we, when we first produced it, the original printing, we did 100,000 copies, which we distributed it very quickly. And so then we did a second printing which of another 20,000 copies, which is almost completely distributed, and we'll be doing a third printing this year um, of these booklets. And one of the things about, I mean, it's a very simple act of implementation, but it be, makes the instrument well known. And in fact, I had a call from someone at the Canadian Human Rights Commission, and she called me up and she said, um, you know, the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples is the best known uh, human rights instrument in Canada, and it's because of those booklets. Um, everyone has those booklets. And so that's, it's a very simple act of implementation, but it's also something because implementation happens on so many levels, and some of them are very straightforward like that, and, and others obviously are more complicated. But in terms of awareness raising, it's one of the things that our organizations jointly have worked on, is to raise awareness around the declaration, raise awareness about why it's important and what it means. And then we had some photocopies here today of some resources, and I know um, that so many, not everyone has them. They are also on the website that York set up for this symposium. All of those documents are on that website so that you can um, access them if you didn't get a paper copy. But there's various resources that we've tried to develop in terms of to help raise awareness around the declaration. And I think one of the things that I'm gonna let um, Paul and Romeo speak about political and legal implementation, but a piece of implementation that we all work a lot on is what I will call social implementation. And social implementation is about uh, making sure that it's used, and, and, and being used is part of implementation. Uh, we were involved several years ago in a symposium where the United Nations Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples wanted to know, when he visited a member state and he did a study and he came up with recommendations to that member state, he wanted to know where those recommendations being implemented. And what came out of that work was that in fact the implementations don't come from governments, implementations they, it comes from the ground. And so in fact, although there is implementation to be done at all levels, implementation has to be done on the ground and it has to be done on all kinds of levels. And I would say that you know, holding symposiums like this is a piece of implementation because it, that is also about awareness raising. It can be implemented in the education system. One of the things that we've always talked about is that the declaration has to be taught. As we were talking this morning about the history of the Indian residential schools that needs to be in our education system and the declaration needs to be in our education system. Uh, a good example of that is after the declaration was adopted and we produced these booklets, we were contacted by the province of New Brunswick, uh, the Ministry of Education, and they ordered enough booklets so that every student going into high school that was taking law would get a copy of the declaration. So it can easily be brought into educational systems. Um, there are child-friendly versions so that it can also be used uh, with uh, children at a younger age group in terms of that. Um, 
uh, there's, we have all of us participated in various types of workshops around awareness raising around the declaration, how you can use the declaration. Some of those workshops happen at the community level. Paul and I have been uh, twice and this summer for the third time to Ellen's community to do that, that type of work at the community level. Um, but also in, we've done those types of workshops with human rights commissions, which is also implementation. And you know, particularly here in Ontario, we know the Ontario Human Rights Commission has uh, put a lot of support behind the declaration, takes that very seriously, as well as the Canadian Human Rights Commission. So there's a lot of ways that that type of implementation where it's being used, where it's being upheld, um, that can happen, and, and we are not dependent on goodwill of governments to see that happen. The more that a human rights instrument is referenced and used, uh, the, the more it is ingrained in, in how we carry forward our work. And that makes the declaration real, and that makes the declaration continue to grow. So I, I'll leave it to uh, these two to talk about those other elements of implementation. Yep. I'll leave it to Paul to, to address the, um, how the courts and other bodies have embraced the, the UN declaration, but uh, let me talk a bit about uh, how I would like to see the declaration being imp implemented in Canada from a political perspective um, and uh, through the Parliament of Canada. Uh, as I mentioned just a while ago, I did submit the private member's bill. The number of the bill is four, uh, C-469. And the bill will be up for debate sometime in 2014. Um, you know, there's a, there are 300 members of parliament in, uh, in the Parliament of Canada, and there's a draw uh, at every legislature. There's a draw uh, where, you know, the, uh, you get to, to be the first or, or the second or the 308th to, to submit to, to have your bill debated, but uh, I think I was somewhere around 197, so my bill will be debated in sometime in 2014 because of that. Um, I also want to want to uh, tell you that the uh, one of the things that Jack Layton asked us when we when we first got when I got elected in 2011 and met with his caucus for the first time. He asked us uh, two things, the 100 and 101 members of uh, the NDP that were elected. He said, I want us to be a forceful uh, uh, party of the opposition, but I also want, to be, uh, want us to be the party of proposition. So um, that, that, that's, that's the idea behind some of the private members' bills that we have. Uh, uh, before Parliament right now. There's also a private member's bill that will allow online petitions to be, to be tabled in Parliament because right now under the present rules, online petitions could not be tabled in Parliament. They have to be signed petitions. So there's a private member's bill from the NDP member, Finn Dunley, I believe, uh, from BC that, uh, that will be also debated and that would allow online petitions uh, to be accepted in, par in the Parliament of Canada. Uh, I believe that the online petition for the UN Declaration and my private member's bill uh, is already on the NDP uh, website, so you can go, go and check and sign on if you, if you approve of this uh, uh, legislative initiative that I, that I, uh, that I started uh, in, the in, the, in, in the House of Commons. Uh, so th those are the type of things that I want, I want to see achieved uh, at least uh, through my efforts. Uh, I know that you know that a lot of times we seem to think that uh, Aboriginal issues in this country are very difficult, are very complex. Um, perhaps, perhaps, but uh, like I said at the outset, uh, it doesn't have to be that way. We there, there are going to be complex and difficult only if we choose. Uh, if we choose that uh, uh, that they be so only because uh, as long as uh, if, if, if Aboriginal issues in, in this country become a priority for for a government I, I intend to insist on that throughout my, my present mandate and hopefully another one 2015 I intend to insist that Aboriginal issues become a priority for for the government uh, because 
that's the missing piece of this wonderful puzzle that, that we call Canada. Just to add, there's a domestic element and then there's an international element. Right now, indigenous governments, their institutions, indigenous peoples in general can use the UN Declaration for all their work, whether it's policy making, decision making, law making, they're free to use it to interpret um, rights and related state obligations. Uh, Jennifer mentioned the human rights bodies. Across Canada, there are federal, provincial, and territorial human rights commissions. They can all use it within their mandate. So if they get a case relating to Indigenous peoples, they can bring in the UN Declaration. Now, um, federally, uh, internationally, the UN Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, the High Commissioner is the highest level person dealing with human rights in the international system. She has said this is a priority in her work, and it is the framework for which she deals or addresses indigenous rights. The UN treaty bodies have the mandate to interpret whatever treaty they're responsible for. So for example, the Human Rights Committee interprets the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. Well, when Canada, who has ratified these various treaties, goes before these bodies, these bodies can turn to Canada, and Canada has to report every four or five years to each of these bodies. And these bodies can say, what are you doing with these concerns or violations of indigenous peoples? And have you used the UN Declaration? And uh, for instance, the Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination turned to the United States while they were still opposing the UN Declaration, while they had voted against it, and said, you should be using the UN Declaration in terms of your obligations under this convention. So there's no way that Canada can escape from it. And the other thing to remember is um, that in 1993 at the World C uh, Conference on Human Rights, the former Secretary General said that human rights is the common language of humanity. And what he meant is you have thousands of different cultures, not only amongst indigenous peoples, but also amongst all peoples of the world. And how are you going to deal with common issues and problems? How are you going to resolve them? How are you going to work together through cooperation and solidarity? Well, human rights is the common language. So there's just no way that Canada, in this case the federal government, can continue to try and not acknowledge that indigenous people's collective rights are human rights. It's only a matter of time. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to add one other thing about implementation and a concrete action. Uh, the declaration was adopted by the General Assembly in September of 2007. And right away, Grand Chief Edward John, who's going to be our final presenter here this afternoon, he had said, let's have a symposium and let's talk about implementation. Let's talk about, now we have it, what, what are we doing with it? And so with, under his leadership was organized a three-day symposium that took place uh, in British Columbia. And out of that symposium uh, came this book. And the book is Realizing the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, Triumph, Hope, and Action. And um, the, the book was, the people who wrote the chapters in the book had all presented at that symposium. And that symposium itself is an act of implementation. There was 300 people that came for three full days to learn about both how the declaration had been developed, what the contents of the declaration are, what does that mean, and how can we all engage with it. And so um, the, the, the depth of that is embodied in this book, which I know if you are in Professor Dawson class, one of his classes, he teaches this book. Um, and also, uh, we do have some copies of it here. I know that there was some people who got it at lunchtime, but if there's other people who are interested, um, I have some copies 
at the end you can see me and you would be under the very good fortune of being able to get almost everyone who wrote in this book is in this room um, and you can go around and get free autographs. So uh, <laughs> I just wanted to make a plug for that piece. Uh, and also um, just to turn it back to Craig for a minute. In terms of implementation, and when we look at implementation, and one of the things, because we know when we talk about implementation, when we talk about reconciliation, and we know how many things are going on currently and where indigenous rights are, are being, continue to be assaulted in this country, and of course resource development projects being a big piece of that. So I'm gonna ask Craig if he would um, give us just a minute to discuss about how implementing the declaration and the declaration feeds into environmental uh, assessment, impact assessments, and how that's feeding into current political uh, climates as well. <coughs> Yeah, this is, this is actually my, my passion at the moment because um, people will know that one of the, the catalysts of uh, Idle No More last year was that aspect of the federal omnibus uh, legislation that really gutted environmental impact assessment in, in Canada and greatly reduced the likelihood that major resource development projects would be subject to an open public uh, environmental impact assessment with an independent panel. Nonetheless, the federal government continues to point to the environmental impact assessment process as the crucial, in fact, pretty much the only example it can give of a formal mechanism by which it is in any way uh, responding to the constitutionally protected and internationally protected rights of, of indigenous people. So when you ask about how are you concretely fulfilling your, your duty to, to consult and accommodate, they'll say, well, we have the environmental impact assessment process. The process is deeply flawed from that point of view because all it can do, for one thing, indigenous peoples typically do not have any say and in input into how the process is structured and, and carried out, but also the process only results in a recommendation which government can, can choose to act on or ignore. Nonetheless, those recommendations do have considerable you know, public political weight when, the, when those rare exceptions, when a case does go to a full, open, uh, independent panel. We know that they can be a real lightning rod for public attention, so they are important moments. We've seen this with a number of hearings. Uh, Amnesty International uh, will be making a formal presentation to a review in about a month's time uh, of the new prosperity, uh, proposed new prosperity gold copper mine on uh, Chilcotin territory. And this is something we're increasingly look at because, precisely because international human rights standards brought into the mix can be so powerful. Uh, assessments carried out under federal legislation they're essentially balanced, you know, they're attempting uh, to, to weigh the balance of the potential benefits of a project versus the potential harm. The potential harm includes impacts on Indigenous people's culture, Indigenous people's use of the land. If we bring into that mix international human rights standards, how you weigh that balance changes considerably because international human rights standards are so very, very clear about the high standard of precaution that has to be applied whenever you're considering something that could impact on that crucial relationship that Romeo began by talking about of indigenous peoples to the land. That the importance of protecting that, the dire consequences of breaking that relationship, and the fact that we have historically already pushed indigenous peoples to the edge by a history of unresolved dispossessions and actions like the residential school program that serve to erode that relationship. So we think that bringing an international framework in can help uh, strike a much more appropriate assessment of, of the risks. You see, the system is not what it should be because Indigenous peoples are not genuinely full participants and the decision is still ends up being in the, hand of, of a, in the hands of a government that never uh, actually engages with those realities. But at least uh, the public record, the truth telling can be improved and that moment of, of public pressure can also be, uh, also be strengthened. Uh, so thank you for, for asking that, that Jennifer. Uh, I think what we want to do at this point is open the uh, discussion up uh, to all of you. If uh, the hand mics are, are ready uh, to, to go, I will try to keep a, a speaking order. And I see uh, one person already um, here. We'll ask, and I've been, I've been uh, asked by the panelists to, um, to enforce this rigorously, we'll ask people to, to make uh, uh, quite short comments uh, and to, to focus on the, uh, on the, the topic of the, the implementation of the Declaration and its relationship to uh, the, the goal of reconciliation and how we have to, to get there. So um, there was a um, third, row, third row down here on this side, if you, if you just start. Okay. Yeah. 
Uh, so my question goes to uh, any of the panelists' vision on imp implementation by the courts in terms of Section 35 jurisprudence, because to date, the courts in looking at Section 35 and interpreting it have been noticeably silent about saying anything with respect to, or at least anything much in terms of the relationship between Aboriginal and treaty rights, as that term is understood in Canada, and human rights. So um, uh, I just throw that question out to any of you who want to answer it. Yeah. Uh, I see that another panelist pointing to Paul at the end. Paul, if you would begin maybe by clarifying for people who may not be familiar uh, the, what Section 35 is. Well, Section 35 uh, one says that the Aboriginal peoples of Canada, which include, um, well, they, as they put it, Indians, Inuit, and Métis peoples, um, it says that the Aboriginal, um, the existing Aboriginal and treaty rights of the Aboriginal peoples of Canada are recognized and affirmed. So the question is, what does that include and how do you interpret it? And Wendy is right that the court has never taken a human rights-based approach. What they thought was, well, we have this provision, There's, we have to put some principles in it, so they basically, and this court is a very respected court, the Supreme Court of Canada basically made up some pr uh, principles that they thought fit with Canada and fit with the historical context. The problem is, is some of the principles do not conform to what has been developed in international human rights law. So what you have right now is the Supreme Court sometimes going in this direction and international human rights law going in that direction. And I think Grand Chief Ed John will speak of a case that's coming up uh, November 7th in appeal to the Supreme Court of Canada. And this whole issue that Wendy just raised uh, will come up. My, f my own belief is that when it says Aboriginal and treaty rights, I believe that that includes all the rights that are in the Declaration. Because when, you, when an Aboriginal people or individual goes before any human rights body internationally or regionally, such as in the inter-American system or in the African system, their rights are always addressed under the human rights system. And they'll say, oh, you're an Aboriginal people from Canada. Well, they still apply human rights. There's no difference in the term between Aboriginal peoples and Indigenous peoples. There's no difference in terms of international human rights law between Aboriginal rights and Indigenous rights. So that's my interpre interpretation. They'll have to go there, and I think that Grand Chief Ed John will talk a little about that important case coming up. There was a, a question, I think, second row from the front here. Uh, first of all, I wanted to appreciate and thank Ellen and Romeo for speaking the original languages of this land. It was so fluent, it was musical. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Second of all, uh, the comment by Ellen about the culture of shame. This is something that in civil war, I mean civil, uh, what was it? I forgot. Uh, civil activities of 1960s in USA. Uh, the black people were also into that position. What they did, it they came with a counter offer of black is beautiful. When they said black is beautiful, that was actually a counter offer or encouragement. The black people started to believe in themselves. They thought it was a war against the culture of shame. Uh, you especially, Ellen, because I'm, I'm, I saw you talking with so much of feeling. Have you done anything like that? I mean, I'm sure that Jennifer will be supporting you if you come up with such logos, uh, you know, with such uh, the slogans, which are beautiful and productive. Have you ever d thought of that? Have you ever done anything on that? Uh, I, I never thought of making a bumper sticker with uh, <laughs> something to do with my identity. Like, I mean, Black is Beautiful is, is it goes, you know, you have two bees going together. 
So we can't even do, agree upon whether we're native, Aboriginal, Indigenous, Guahua, you know, um, I, I, I was raised to be proud of who I am, be, and, and I, you know, I, I treasure those teachings. And it's trying to get that to the youth to be proud of who they are, because what they see is dysfunction and arguing and, and, and blah, blah, blah. Um, it's something I think we'd have to maybe consult with uh, our people on, and what kind of bumper sticker we'd like to see. Um, <laughs> I mean, for, for lack of anything, I mean, there's, there's the idle no more kind of thing that, that's reuniting both indigenous people and, uh, you know, the average Canadian. Um, and I, I do appreciate your, your comment, but, you know, the, the, the depths of um, harm that the residential school did to to the psyche, um, it, it it goes very very deep. And you know, I I think f I, I, a lot of people here who who you know who didn't go to residential school but felt the impact of residential school will agree that and and psychologists will agree that when you're when you're on this road to healing, it's like it's like that onion, right? The onion. There's one one layer that falls off, another layer that falls off. Um, so, it's not easy to come up with a word that would describe how beautiful and how rich Indigenous people's cultures are. It's beautiful, but it's so much more than beautiful. Uh, you know, for, for, for something that's really wonderful or beautiful, and I'm sure my, my, my Mohawk teachers would probably say, no, there's another word for it, but all I can think of is, kwahigaritiyoyonere. It's something like that you like something, it's really wonderful, it's beautiful, it's, you know, there's so many things in there. And I think when we look at the, the richness of our culture, we can say it's exciting too. I mean, I was listening to, to Romeo talking about his, his first formative years on the land. It's exciting. You know, you go canoeing, you see the water, you see the birds, you wake up with all the things of creation that the Creator put on, on there for us. So, Indigenous means something different to different people, but at the end of the day, it means you're part of creation. And I don't think that people would put that on a, on a bumper sticker, but um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm certainly hoping that the legacy that we leave behind um, will do away with bump, bumper stickers and, and we'll, we'll, we'll talk about, um, you know, my, my DNA is like your DNA. And I, you know, it, it goes even deeper to, to being a woman. You know, you have to be slim, beautiful, wear a certain kind of clothes. And, 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 and so the, the complexity of global society impacting indigenous identity um, is, is so vast. But I like your idea. <laughs> and um, I, I will definitely think on it. Thank you. Uh, and I know I, there are there are a couple hands toward the the back, and I, I see see one person to the right. Was there somebody earlier that I am missing now? No. Uh, my question is um, kind of about the actual the Texas Declaration, and I know that it's had a, a long history um, in order to get to get it actually um, into the UN. But I'm just looking through it now, and Article 46 seems to stick out as being, I guess, a product of the struggle, because it, it says uh, nothing in this declaration may be construed as authorizing or encouraging action which would dismember or impair the territorial integrity or political unity of sovereign and independent states. And I was wondering how that interferes with, for example, Articles 2, 3, and f or, or sorry, 3, 4, and 5 about um, the right to self-determination and whether governments could possibly use that against uh, indigenous rights? Is, is that an issue or uh, have, you, have you thought about it? That's, that's an excellent question. I think um, uh, any other panelists could, could wait in. I don't know if, Romeo, if you wanted to, uh, to take that or? Well, uh, I can start and I'm not sure Paul will be able to 
um, complete. Um, the, this article came about because of the concerns uh, that were raised exactly about the uh, territorial integrity of, uh, of uh, the member states in our discussions, in particular with respect to the right of self-determination that we find under Article 3. Um, and Paul can elaborate on this. International law al already provides for those concerns. And that uh, the, art the article in question 46 that you just quoted was meant to reflect the actual state of international law to respond to the concerns that member, certain member states um, had with respect to that right of self-determination of indigenous peoples and their territorial integrity. Uh, that's one thing. The other aspect that, that, uh, that is uh, essential to mention here is, is the fact that, again, uh, we need to read the UN Declaration uh, not in isolation, uh, article by article, but as a whole. Uh, all of the other articles, and a lot of the articles talk about collaboration, partnership, cooperation, mutual respect, and so on and so forth, and as well as the uh, international human rights in general. Uh, so uh, we cannot just uh, uh, take Article 3, for instance, for race self-determination, and read it in isolation. Uh, because that, that was the concern that many states at the beginning of the process, that, that's why it took so long in the process uh, to get the right of self-determination without qualification uh, uh, to get it accepted. Uh, that's why it took so long to have the word peoples in, in our discussions. Uh, that was a long, uh, from, for many years we had to discuss uh, that we insisted that we use the word peoples with respect to indigenous peoples because uh, that was uh, using, using people otherwise would have been discriminatory towards indigenous peoples. But I'll, I'll let Paul uh, complete the answer. Now, Romeo is absolutely right. Um, the certain states really wanted it in, especially the African states. Within the African continent, there are a lot of conflicts both within the existing states and also between states. And um, I have to say that Canada, Australia, especially Canada and New Zealand, were urging uh, the African states to raise problems with the declaration. And it did cause an eight month delay. So there had to be some compromises to satisfy the African states. They weren't the only states that have that problem, Latin American states, but the Latin American states had been pretty much on board, most of them. But why it can't affect, as Romeo said, anything but reflect existing international law, which has the principle of territorial integrity to balance the right of self-determination. Right of self-determination isn't absolute. Human rights are usually not absolute, except maybe torture or genocide, but usually it's relative. And um, the provisions that safeguard it, for instance, Article 44, uh, 45, sorry, says nothing in this declaration may be construed as diminishing or extinguishing the rights indigenous peoples have now or may acquire in the future. So whatever rights they had in international law up to this declaration could not be changed by any article here. Secondly, it's important to, um, we also put in the preamble because we negotiated these provisions. Again, it's PP 17, it's on. No, it's uh, on don't give page numbers because there's two different booklets. Oh, two different booklets, okay. Basically what it says is that nothing in this declaration may be used to deny any people any peoples, their right to self-determination exercised in conformity with international law. We argued, we're not asking for anything new. These are the inherent rights that all peoples have, the right to self-determination. And so that was put in as further assurance. Now, the first preambular paragraph, see you can't see it just by reading it, but it says, guided by the purposes and principles of the Charter of the United Nations, now, what are the purposes and principles of the Charter that are to guide this? Well, one of them is the principle of equal rights and self-determination of peoples. That's in the Charter. 
So that too helps to re reinforce the right of self-determination that you uh, mentioned in Article 3. I just wanted to, to make sure that that was, uh, that went to your question. Yeah, go, please go ahead. Um, I was wondering uh, how exactly in practice does the balance work? Like if you have a, if a peoples have a referendum to cede from a country, can they do that under international law? Does this have any, does this, does this declaration have any effect on it? And um, because, because it, it, it's the self, right to self-determination up to that point, like up to, it, it seems like, like you have rights until you stand up for them. Like it says that you have rights, but then if you choose to go that far as to cede from the country or, or to you know, come up with your own political solution, and that Article 46 kind of says that states have the right to territorial integrity, then it, it, they're, like they're, they're, in, um, they're at odds. So how does that how, how does the how does that work in practice? Well, we'll do it the same way again. <laughs> um, we got to understand as well. One one of, one of the things we need to understand when we discuss uh, the concept of self determination is uh, there are mul multiple facets to the right of self determination. Self determination doesn't. Uh, necessarily only mean to become a country or independent. Uh, uh, unilateral secession, uh, if you refer to the Quebec secession case, uh, reference case to the Supreme Court uh, 1998. Um, uh, again, uh, unilateral uh, secession is a, is, a, is a measure of last resort. And the right of self-determination also includes concept of cooperation. For instance, treaty relations. Uh, my people decided to have, as a, in the exercise of their right to self-determination, a treaty relationship with both Canada and Quebec under the James Bay North and Quebec Agreement. That's, that's how we exercise our right of self-determination because we viewed that politically that was perhaps the best thing for our people. So uh, again, uh, the right of self-determination has multiple facets. Uh, a lot of people understand that uh, self-determination means separation and dismembering of, uh, of member states uh, around the world, but that, that, that is not necessarily the case. <clears throat> yeah. I'll just say that self-determination and the principle of territorial integrity will always be balanced one against the other. And it depends on the facts and law in each case. And as Romeo mentioned, you have to have a very serious case of human rights violations to take the measure of unilateral secession. And even then, there can be problems if other countries don't recognize you. So it can be quite complicated, and we're not going to get into it here. But as Romeo mentioned, within the state or uh, indigenous peoples are not just domestic actors. In indigenous peoples are also international actors. All these standards that are being set, and more and more are being set internationally, uh, it's indigenous peoples representing themselves from all over the world. States could never represent indigenous peoples there because states violate those rights, and states will not put forward the full positions of indigenous peoples. So that is an act of self-determination that's ongoing internationally. It's not just domestic, but domestic is important too, over lands and resources. The right to resources is in paragraph two of article one of the covenants that deals with the right of self-determination. It is also said that the right of self-determination is a prerequisite for peoples in terms of the exercise of all other human rights. So when one reads the UN Declaration, and it's according, and it wasn't created by the Declaration, the Declaration affirms the right to self-determination that's already in the international human rights covenants for all peoples. But again, you have to read it in the, with the lens of self-determination. And that brings up a lot of issues where indigenous peoples have to have control. Thank you. 
I think there, you were about, to, there was a question down to the side, am I right or wrong? Hi, um, thanks a lot for the whole day. It's been really informative and very interesting. Um, I had two questions, which can be addressed by anyone, whatever. Um, the first question is, if any of you could talk a little bit more about your experience um, over time, organizing at the international level, transnationally. And, you know, I know people learn a lot from people from everywhere else in the world that maybe have a, a variable understanding of indigeneity or of their rights. So um, I'm wondering if anyone has any reflections on how their own understandings have developed in conjunction sort of with other people's understandings, maybe that aren't coming from Canada, for example. Um, and my other question was more technical, and I don't know if it's very useful, but I'm wondering about people who have status or are non-status in, in Canada. How, how do people identify that in relation to the declaration um, being indigenous? How, how does that work legally if people are using this declaration? It might just be an, a question of ignorance, I'm not sure, but if anyone would like to address that. Okay. Okay, thank you for that. Actually, I mean, it's a, it's a good question. Maybe we, uh, we, so the two questions, but maybe we go with the, the, the second one is whether uh, the distinction in, in Canada between, between status, non-status, if that has any implications for understanding the, this concept in international law of, of indigenous people, indigenous persons. That's a, it's a good question, and it's, a, it's, it's sort of been, I would say, the bane of indigenous women's existence. Uh, because of the Indian Act, the Indian Act, they knew that in order to destroy uh, our nations, they would go through the women. And so many women have, um, before 1985, when they married a non-Indigenous person, they lost their rights in Indian status. But we have to remember Indian status is also given to us by the colonial, the colonizer. It's not, it's not us determining who is a member of our nation. But in the UN Declaration in Article 6, every indigenous individual has the right to a nationality. Included with, within the right to self-determination, also that that nation has, to, has the right to choose who are its citizens. It gets very complex and, and very mired in um, sometimes a, a very much a colonial way of approaching something that should be a given. In our customary ways, when you are a citizen of our nations, I'll talk about the Haudenosaunee. It's not just, here's my red card. It's, what am I doing giving back to the nation? What am I doing giving back in my obligations to take care of the earth, to take care of all the creations? What's my part in building our nations and transmitting <coughs> that knowledge? As opposed to the colonial way, which is, here's a card. Um, we're, going to, <coughs> we're going to allow you to have part of your trust fund for your education. I'm not going to say free education because that is part of a government propaganda that vilifies indigenous people to the Canadian public. <coughs> it's not free education. It's our trust fund money. And with, in December 2010, there was Bill C3 or S3, which allowed the grandchildren <coughs> of the women who lost status, because we're like, Purebreds, they were like, uh, whether you're a horse, racehorse or a dog, <coughs> where you have this bloodline, and there's four different kinds of, of ways to obtain status, and one is blood quantum. And it really, they are, they, they're all blood quantum. Um, but Bill S3 allowed the indigenous women who married non-indigenous men, their grandchildren, to move up a notch and their children to move up a notch in regards to having a uh, full status. But what's this all about anyways? It's about who is entitled to live on lands reserved for Indians. And it goes even deeper, it goes into the land grab. If you have less status Indians, and they're all moving to the urban areas because life is so frickin' miserable in the communities because of the dysfunction that was created by band councils imposed by the Canadian government. 
then you're not going to need reserve systems anymore because everybody's in the urban areas getting all their needs met. Because in the meantime, what, what's happening in the communities is they're shrinking our budgets, our, our population is growing, and, and so the term of indigenous becomes something that is, he, you know, it, it's, it's debated in, in so, on so many levels. And I know you thought you'd get a, a very simple answer to your question, and I'm sorry I'm not giving you that. But it's very complicated, and it's really about, and this is what I, what I want to say is, in order to implement the Declaration and to have all Indigenous peoples' rights fully respected, we have to restore the role and the authority and the equality of Indigenous women throughout because there are some nations that have accepted the patriarchal values that came over with the Mayflower and Columbus. I don't care what nation you belong to. Indigenous women played a very important role in the survival of our nations. And what colonization did was disgusting. And, you know, Canadians need to realize that this genocide that happened in their country, and if they do not implement this declaration, Indigenous women will continue to have this marginalization. We have a wonderful project by Christy Belcourt called Walking with Our Sisters to educate the Canadian public about our 600 plus murdered and missing Aboriginal women that the RCMP could give two hoots about investigating. That's what Indigenous status is all about, right? It's, it's about what are you going to win? Well, if you look, the latest report came out, how many Indigenous pe whip children are living in poverty? So tell me that Indian status has benefits. You know? Um, I forget what your other question was, but I'm sorry. I'll, I'll end it right there, sorry. As a, as a bridge to answering your other question, I think it's worth noting as well that, that those kinds of imposed definitions of who is and is not Indigenous, such as the Canadian government's imposition of status, non-status, uh, we see this around the world. We see states rejecting the very existence of Indigenous peoples, and the declaration is, is quite clear that it's not the power or the role of states to define who is and is not Indigenous. It's the right of Indigenous peoples to determine that uh, for themselves, uh, set out in, in Article 33. Uh, I think that that's one of the, the things you look at in comparison around the world and you see how the declaration comes to play in relation to the unique realities of indigenous peoples around the world, that so many indigenous peoples you know, suffer under a situation in which their very existence uh, is, is utterly denied. But your, the other part of your question was that, that aspect of the, you know, what, what's emerged from the experience of, of, of meeting, working alongside of and advocating uh, together with indigenous peoples from other parts of the world, uh, how that experience sort of shapes our understanding of Indigenous rights. Uh, maybe, uh, Romeo, if you, because you were talking about your own experience of going to the United Nations over the years. Uh, just, just to complete the, uh, the aspect of the first question, uh, or the question that was just answered, uh, uh, that is perhaps the, the other reason why uh, we, don't have, we don't have, under the Declaration, a definition for Indigenous peoples. Just as under international law, we don't have a definition for peoples who have that right of self-determination uh, because there are complex issues and, and Ellen, Ellen is quite right. Uh, these are rights that belong to the institutions of the indigenous peoples themselves to determine um, who is uh, their citizen, who is their citizens, who are their citizens. Um, one thing I noticed uh, when I went to the Truth and Recon Reconciliation Commission and. Uh, to answer the, the second question. Uh, in Montreal, um, us uh, survival, uh, survivors of residential schools uh, do not have the opportunity to, to gather often. Uh, wherever, whatever we do in our lives today, wherever we are in our lives today, we don't get to meet a lot of other survivors. And there was something special when I attended the the, uh, the national event in Montreal um, earlier, uh, two months ago or a month ago. And there was something special there and you, you could feel the energy, the positive energy that was, that, uh, that, uh, that was present in that room because of, that there were so many 
uh, residential school survivors in that same room uh, at the same time. Uh, so th there was something special there that I felt. And, and similarly, uh, the experience in, <coughs> uh, in the work that we did at the international level, um, all of a sudden, and it's part of, uh, I guess, the decolonization of our, of our mentalities um, and decolonization itself, uh, when you get to meet people that went through the same experiences, that went through the, hard, the same hardships, that went through the same injustices that I talked about earlier, the, uh, the same grave violations of their basic and fundamental human rights from all parts of the world, you gather strength from that experience because you get to say, hey, my people are not alone. We are not alone in this struggle, in this fight to achieve finally justice uh, for indigenous peoples around the planet. So that, that's the single most uh, important element that I, that I drew from my experience at least, and besides meeting all these wonderful people, of course, <laughs> but uh, that experience of meeting and, uh, and discussing and exchanging and sharing with other indigenous peoples and representatives from around the world was just unique and, and absolutely form, formidable for, for um, uh, the network that we managed to, to build from that and, the, the, and the, the continued friendships that we have today and, and helping each other and reaching out to, um, throughout the planet uh, to our brothers and sisters. That's, that was unique. A little bit on that and the international experience and uh, echoing Romeo's comments. One of the things that was truly extraordinary in this work is the way that Indigenous peoples came from every corner of the globe, um, many of them with the stories of the dispossession and extreme human rights violations in their communities. And that, and that out of that grew, um, well, eventually the declaration, but also this incredible movement. And we have now, throughout the international human rights system, a, a really concentrated focus on the rights of Indigenous peoples. And the UN has a United Nations Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues, and uh, who uh, Grand Chief Ed John is a member of that. Um, the UN has a UN Expert Mechanism on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, and uh, Chief Wilton Littlechild is an expert member of that. We have a special rapporteur on the rights of indigenous peoples. And all of those things came through this process. And remember, this process only began in the late 70s in terms of this really push on the international level. So all of that energy created a lot of positive things. And I think one of the other great things about going outside of Canada um, has been that we also can see different ways of looking at this work in different countries. And one of the things that we've seen, I mean, we find that in the current uh, uh, political climate in Canada, a lot of this work is a big struggle. In other countries, they're approaching it differently. And, um, and I think that's always useful to focus on because when governments want to say, oh, it's too difficult to do this work, um, or, you know, oh, that's a set of lofty ideals, but how would you make that real in principle? But that's not what all governments are saying. And so uh, just a few quick examples of that, um, you know, uh, this, the state of Denmark and Greenland have reconfigured their political relationship and, and have proclaimed that as de facto implementation of the UN Declaration. Um, that's a very serious political move by a nation state to, to work with the people of Greenland on what that relationship is now going to look like. And another example from Japan, uh, during the uh, negotiations of the declaration, Japan repeatedly said, we don't have indigenous peoples. And um, Japan voted in favor of the declaration, and after the declaration was adopted, Japan made a formal announcement that the Ainu are indigenous people in Japan, and we recognize this because we have supported the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. It doesn't mean that the state of Japan um, and the Ainu have worked out all their challenges, but, but it's a step. And one of the other um, ones that I just will draw your attention to, which is in the 
back of the, the booklets is there's a, a statement from Norway, which they've made several times, which is the declaration contextualizes all existing human rights for indigenous peoples and provides therefore a natural frame of reference for work and debate relating to the promotion of indigenous people's rights. And again, it doesn't mean that the Sami and the government of Norway don't have challenges, they do. But their approach is one of, okay, so let's use the declaration to address those challenges and find a way to move forward in cooperation rather than in, as Romeo said earlier on, with an adversarial relationship. So I think that that's one of the other international components that we can see is, you know, we can approach uh, some of these, th we can learn from how this is being approached in different areas of the world that we are not yet seeing here. I think we have time for one last uh, question. <laughs> As I say to my students, I always get the last word. Um, picking up on exactly what you've been talking about, and I'd, I'd like to direct this question to you, Ellen. You've mentioned uh, three in very, very important concepts. Um, one was education. The second was colonialism, and the third was patriarchy. How do you see the revitalization of indigeneity given the endemic difficulties with patriarchy? with a continuation of colonialism which is invested in globalization? And how do we ensure that sovereignty in terms of education is revitalized? It's an excellent question and it's extremely complex to answer, but I, first thing that came to my mind is one person at a time. One step at a time, and, and it's, you know, to, to, to quote a cliche, you know, you, the, you drop that pebble in, in, in the pond and it ripples. And, and I think it's, we've been doing that for, for, for many, many generations because um, I just want to add something to that, what, what was discussed. Uh, at the, the CBD, the Convention on Biodiversity and the, the, the draft Nagoya Protocol before it became a protocol, I was speaking out, making interventions, and refuting what Canada was saying. And there was a woman from India, she's one of the indigenous people from India, who came up to me afterwards and she said, you are so brave, because if I were to do that here, when I return home to my country, I would be killed. And it really, I, I've always appreciated the fact that I can say what I say in Canada. I've had my privacy invaded and, you know, I'm, I, we're still struggling to get any kind of justice for, for my community, but, you know, I appreciate the fact that York University is doing something like this. I appreciate the fact that I have such intelligent and passionate people to work with in regards to promoting and protecting Indigenous people's rights. I think the spark has already been there in revitalizing it. And, 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 and it's to regenerate as well those things that have been attacked. There's so many richness uh, in human rights that we can look at and use in conjunction with our own indigenous languages, culture, and customs. And because I think there's one thing that, there's one common thread that, that is threatening every single person in this room, it doesn't matter who you are, and that is the threat to our environment that we depend on for life. And if we stand shoulder to shoulder with the people who are protesting the tar sands, who are protesting Embridge, who are protesting any kind of injustice, including, you know, this is gonna be controversial when I say, you know, bringing, bringing a child soldier, Amr Khadr, back from Guantanamo Bay, a child soldier who I thought, you know, like in war, there is no such thing as murder. Because when there is justice, and I'll, and I'll use what, what, what Jennifer said from, from Rosalie uh, Silberman, Abella, 
we have no business figuring out the cost of justice until we can figure out the cost of injustice. The education system in Canada and the US, and I think indeed in throughout the world, has failed. It's failing everybody, but in particular, Indigenous children. As the right to self-determination includes the right to control our own education and bring in our cultural legends and our, our, our languages, I think we should be assimilating you because your assimilation of us has not been working for us. And that's what the Turo is about. You can live with us, but you have to understand that this is how we take care of the land. You can live with us, but this is how we take care of the water. You can live with us, but when you cut a tree, you have to ask us because it's very important and we have to ask permission. And that's what, that's what peaceful coexistence means. And the webcast, you know, I love this, this, this new medium that I really, you know, sometimes bugs me, but because I don't know how to use it properly, but this medium of a webcast where people from another part of the world can listen to us, hear what we're saying, is regenerating justice and education. So I think we were, we're doing it. We just need to, to make the people who think that money is the most important thing, we need to make them understand it. Because at the end of the day, as, as another cliche, you cannot eat money. It will not bring you happiness. But what does bring you happiness is when you feel good inside about yourself and you've achieved that peace and you understand that we're just a little speck in the universe. This is the only planet we have to go on. We're not going to go to the moon and we're not going to go to Mars tomorrow. So uh, indigenous people's rights are human rights. Indigenous people's rights can benefit you all. And, I, I, and we're not a threat to anybody's energy security, uh, financial security. We are with you. Um, you just need to start paying more attention and listening to us, that's all. Thank you very much, it's been an honor. I think we, I think we should let that be the, the last word and I hope you'll join me in, in thanking all of our panelists, uh, Paul Joff, Romeo Saganash, Jennifer Preston, and Alan Gabriel. <laughs>